Okay, what is going on guys? Today I want to break down five concepts that every single backend developer should know. These are the sort of core pillars that you're going to need to understand in order to build real world scalable backend applications. So I'm going to break down each of these, give you a brief example of how they're used, and then maybe in the future I'll go more in depth on each one, but sort of want to introduce all of them, get you on the right path, and go from there. Uh, but before I get into that, I just want to say uh, thank you for the support. Every single day in November, we're going to be uploading something new, so please subscribe, join up to get notified on this, try to grow as fast as we can, get as much done as humanly possible, and just see how this goes. So without further ado, let's start breaking these down. All right, so concept number one is going to be middleware. Middleware is something that um, a lot of people don't leverage correctly and a lot of people should be using in more places than they probably are. So first of all, what is middleware? Middleware is effectively some a function that you can run before a request. So if you think about the life cycle of a request on your back end, the end user is going to make a request to your server. Say they make a get request to the index page. Then your middlewares will then fire. So if we had our app use something, if we said like app.use some middleware, then that middleware would get called and then it would go on to actually serve the request. So let me show you an example of this real quick. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do const n middleware equals, and then this will need to take in request, response, and next. And then we are just going to do um, console.log hello. And now we are just going to call the next function. So now what we need to do is we need to do app.use um, and middleware. Perfect. So now what we've done is I just have this basic I have this basic express app and what I've added is a middleware. So every time we make a request after calling this after we invoke this app.use, every single request that we make will first call this end middleware function. And inside of this middleware function, it's made up of three parts. It has a request, a response, which are just the normal two pieces you always have, and then it also has this next function. So what's nice about a middleware is you can do basically anything you want inside here, and the most common use cases are logging and authentication. So this next function will just say, okay, we're done with this middleware, let's move on to the next thing, which would be this. However, if we wanted to, we could send a response here. So if they didn't have a certain header or they didn't have the right API key or they weren't logged in, we could send them, we could just return a response and then not call this next function and then the request would get terminated right there. So we could send back a 404 not found if they try to access a deleted resource or whatever you want to do. So if we actually run this and I go to localhost 3000, you'll see on in my browser I just have hello world as you would expect. But I also get down here, hello, because this middleware is being run through, um, this middleware is running before this request. So uh, to illustrate what I just mentioned earlier, the sort of redirecting them or sending them back if certain conditions are met, I am going to pull out some request parameters. So I'm going to say const, um, yeah, sure. We'll pull out the name from the query. And I'm going to say if name. So if the name is defined, I'm going to do console.log hello name. Now, if their name is not defined, and call next. So we're just going to say hello, and then call next. Now, however, if they don't provide a name, I am going to send, um, who are you? So what this will do real quick is we can delete all of this. So we have all our, our cases matched. And if I run this again, I go to localhost 3000. It's going to say, who are you? Because I didn't have a name in here. But now if I add a parameter, so name equals then. We run this again, it's going to say hello world because we had that parameter, and then in my console.log it's going to say hello Ben. So this is just a basic example of all the different things you can do, but these are really, really powerful and really important for building out scalable applications. Because the way you would initially implement authentication would be like, uh, do an auth check right here. So we would just auth check here do whatever we need to do, but then we would have to copy paste this auth check into every single root and that gets really inefficient and really bad. So we want to pull that out of each individual root and then we want to have our app use that middleware for each individual thing. And now another thing that we can do with these middlewares is instead of just having app.use and middleware, so then every single um, request from here on out will use this middleware, what we could then do is we could instead pass this in as an argument to this function. So we pass in n middleware. Now this is going to use this middleware, but then if I did, um, let's just paste this. So now I have these two different roots. So this one up here is going to use the middleware, this one won't. So if I go to the root right here, so we go to this, it's gonna say, who are you? 
But then if we go to this guy right here, which is no middleware, and I do this, it's just gonna say no check because nothing got checked, nothing got ran, and we didn't even run this at all. So yeah, that's just a brief introduction to middleware. Highly recommend you use these. The next thing I wanna talk about is HTTP. So you're all, a lot of, most people are familiar with just how like a, res, a request and a response works. You take in a request and then you send back a response. That's pretty basic. But a lot of people don't understand how HTTP actually works and what's actually involved within a request and a response. So the best way to do this is to actually break down a request in a, an HTTP client. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this. I'm going to make a new request and I'm going to go HTTP colon slash slash local host. 3000. So this is going to make a request to this route right here. And I have this middleware attached to it, which is going to run. So I guess for the sake of this example, I'm going to pull this out. And I'm just going to say, hello world, add my comma, and then we're done. So we go into this request and we fire it. We're going to just get hello world back and it works. But now let's look at what this is actually, what, let's look at what this, uh, what this request actually contains. So the first thing it has is it has query parameters. So this does a good, has a nice visual way of doing it, but if I wanted to add name and then I wanted to just be my name, this will now be passed in as a parameter which we can then access on the request object. We can also pass in headers and this is where stuff like the user agent, the accept comes from, and it also brings in stuff like if you wanna pass in an API key or something, you should pass those via headers instead of via query parameters because they're, these HTTP headers aren't saved in like a browser history or something like that. So then the next thing we have over here is just off. This is actually just gonna populate the headers for us, doesn't actually matter. Then we have the body and the body is what will contain the main like payload of our request. A get request by convention does not have a body. It'll just pass in uh, query parameters and, and headers, but then a post request is going to contain a body which will actually mutate the data. That's getting a little ahead of ourselves because next I wanna talk about what this is up here. So get, post, put, patch, delete, et cetera, et cetera. These are all standards that have been defined by the, like whatever the web standards organization is that runs this stuff. And these are the conventions by which we make requests. So when we make a request, we define, okay, is it a get request? Is it a post request or whatever? And these will then, our server can then look at that and then match our request to whatever we make. So when I'm making this get request to the slash, it will only accept a get request. If I make a post request to this, it's gonna say not found because I don't handle the post request anywhere. In order to do that, I would need to do this again. And then I would need to say app.post. And now if I run this back, it will get hello world as we would expect because it's now going to handle it through that post request. And what's important about this is how this actually interacts with the browser. So if we look at this over here, when I'm making this request to localhost 3000 on my browser, what's actually happening under the hood is a get request is being fired. Whenever you go to google.com or whatever, you're actually making a get request to google.com and then it'll send back a bunch of HTML and JavaScript, which will then make, the JavaScript will make more requests and it'll fetch more stuff, do whatever it needs to do and populate that out to your page. So the reason why you can go and test this in a browser is because you're making get requests. But if, for example, I wanted to change this just to illustrate it, so I just said hello post, and I go to localhost 3000 to refresh this, it's going to keep saying hello world because this is a get request versus if I send a post request, it's going to say hello post. So those are the sort of basics of an HTTP request, but now the response also has these same characteristics. So when we look at this response object we get over here, this is the response body. This is a mirror of the um, actual request body. So you could send back JSON, you could send back XML, whatever you want to, or just raw. So you just send back this response body. Then you can all, it will also be sent back with headers. So these headers right here is saying, okay, so it's being powered by Express, tells you the content length. It gives you all this basic information about it. And these, this is where you could send back something like an API key or whatever you want. But sort of the point I'm trying to make is that these request and response objects are how information is passed back and forth over the internet. Anytime you're making a request Anytime you're on a web page or you're submitting a form or you're fetching data, these it's happening fundamentally over HTTP. There are some other protocols which can handle this like RPC or whatever, but for the sake of this, just worry about HTTP. So make sure that you learn and understand the get request versus post request and all the other different types of requests and how these actually work and then get used to using the request and response object.
Okay, so last thing I want to do is sort of look at like an example of actually using these on the request or response objects. So here I'm going to pass in the, I'm going to want to console log the request body. But what I need to do first is I need to tell it to accept the JSON. So I'm going to use a built-in express middleware, which is app.useExpress.json. So now every time I make a request, it will then parse it as JSON for, it will parse the body as JSON. So I go in here and I have my request and then my request.body and I'm just console.logging this. On this post request, I have content and then just some random garbage. We hit send and it'll show me what this is. So now we have this object, which we can then parse out. I wanted to add something to this like content too, and then uh, random content, hit send. You'll see it populates here. And the same thing in the response, if I wanted to change my res.json and then I wanted to pass back some real content, I could just say message hello world, and then this will get passed back as such. The request object will give us access to all of this stuff that you see here, the query, the headers, the body, all that stuff. And then the response object will then give us access to the headers, the response, um, the response body, the response headers, response cookies, whatever you Or the next concept I want to talk about is cores. So cores is one of the most obnoxious things you're going to have to deal with. Cores is cross-origin resource sharing. It's effectively how the server and the browser dictate what responses, what requests should be allowed from where. Whenever you try and make a request from a script tag or from a browser, like JS, the JS in a browser, it will send that to that server and then that server will look at its cores policy and see whether or not it will allow that. So with this little API I built right here, if I put this up in production and tried to make a request to it from a normal React app on some domain, I am going to get a cores error. It's gonna say, hey, we don't allow from this because it's not the same origin. By default, it will allow from the same origin. So if I made a request from localhost 3000 to localhost 3000, it would be okay with that. But if I tried to make a re request from localhost 3000 to localhost 4000, it would not be okay with that. So there are a lot of different things you can do to actually fix this and change this, which I'm not going to get too deep into right now because that is a whole, it's a very deep topic that deserves its own sort of breakdown. But what I do want to say is that you can use almost every backend framework is going to have a cores middleware. And what that will do is it will allow um, requests from any origin. So for this example right here, I just have a very basic express app. So let me show you how to actually fix the cores issue here. So all you need to do is just npm i cores. So we're going to need to add this cores package and then we're going to just need to use this cores middleware. So we do app.use and then cores. All right, so all we had to do is just import cores from cores and then app.use cores. So now, since we have, we're now using this middleware of cores, every time we make a request, so a post request, a get request, whatever, after this point, it will then fire this cores middleware first. And since it's firing that cores middleware, it that will fix all of the issues that you're going to have with blocking from other domains and allow you to get that stuff through. Now, if you're going to do this, this will allow requests from anywhere. So you're going to need to implement some sort of other security mechanism by default, uh, be that an API key, OAuth, regular authentication, whatever you want to do, you need to have some way of protecting your backend. So make sure that you implement that if you're going to expose this to another domain, which you're almost certainly going to have to if you have like a separate backend from your front end, unless you're using like a monolith type thing like Next or something like that. Next, we have databases. Databases are something that you are going to almost certainly have to work with if you're working on a backend project or building out a backend server. And the biggest thing you need to understand is do you want to use a document database or a relational database? And do you want to use an ORM? So let's start with the documents versus relational. So this is a diagram I made a while ago, but this sort of just illustrates the MongoDB type document database over here versus a SQL type database over here. And whenever you're building out a backend, especially from scratch, you have to make the decision, what type of database do I want to use? And I'm going to say 90% of the time, it's going to be a SQL type database. More often than not, this is sort of how you want to model your data. Because if you think about how real world data works, how a, let's just take, for example, a um, classroom management software. If you had students, you needed to rela relate those students to their teachers. You need to relate homework assignments to the students and you need to relate those homework assignments to their class, so on and so forth. This sort of system just makes more sense for most real world applications. However, there are some unique use cases where a document-based database like MongoDB will be a better choice when you need to do something along the lines of, in my case, it's, well, 
It's working with real documents effectively, or data that is best modeled as JSON that has very shallow relations, meaning like maybe you could relate like a user to its post, but like that you can just use one ID and it doesn't go any deeper than that. That is a sort of use case where, yeah, you could get away with MongoDB and you're going to gain a lot. You're going to gain a lot from this because MongoDB and these document databases, they have, they're very fast. They're very easy to work with. They're more intuitive in a lot of ways than SQL. And they have really powerful aggregations that make them extremely enticing to use. But in the real world, more often than not, use SQL. So then after the sort of documents versus relational question, it becomes, should you use an ORM? So what is an ORM? Prisma is the best example of an ORM I can give you. And if you are a TypeScript or Node developer, this is the one that I would recommend for you. Okay, so what Prisma is, is Prisma is an ORM or an object relational mapper. And what this does is it allows you to work with your relational database in a way that is much more intuitive and a lot quicker and easier than writing the raw SQL queries by default. So Prisma allows you to first define a schema, and the schema is very important. This is something that you don't get in a document-based database. In a document database, you can have a schema, but typically it's not enforced, and you could put two completely different looking documents in one collection and it wouldn't yell at you, versus you can't do that in SQL. So what Prisma will do is you can define the schema, then migrate that schema onto your database, then once you have that schema created, it'll generate a client for you, and then within this client, you can then make, um, you can then query your database in a very natural sort of object oriented way. So we look right here, we have const user equals await prisma.user.create, all this stuff. So instead of what this is doing, um, so what this is doing is this is abstracting out the the actual SQL that you would then have to write the create user star, you know, whatever it is. I don't know the SQL query off the top of my head, but it takes that away. So instead of having to write the custom SQL, you just call this function, which is a much, much easier and more intuitive way to work with your database. And it's also so much faster. Writing raw SQL will slow you down a lot. And these will make actually handling that much quicker. It also handle getting types for you, getting all this stuff. So one of the biggest things you need to know for backend development is that you should be using an ORM. And one of the best ORMs for the TypeScript world is Prisma. So if you're looking at learning backend development, learn Prisma. Okay, and for the last concept I wanna talk about, this is gonna be cron jobs. This one is probably the most out of left field out of everything I've talked about. The first four are very basic things that you're gonna have to deal with every single day, but cron jobs are a little different. What a cron job is, is it's something that will run in a certain interval. It's like a function or a task that every X number of minutes or X number of hours, it will execute that function and do something for you. So in this case, I am, I'm actually using one of the, a part of the insider viz backend as an example here. So what you're looking at right now is actually the thing that we use to fetch all of our new forms and data for insider viz so this is how we get our new form fours our new 13 f so i won't show you the code within here but you get the sort of idea that what we're doing is i create this new instance of a cron job so i create this new scheduler and i say every two minutes i want to do this function so every two minutes this server is going to call it's going to execute this function get these new forms print all this stuff out and then go from there and then I also have the same thing where every 10 minutes, it's going to run the big heavy aggregations we have to do to populate stuff like cluster buys, top companies, et cetera, et cetera. So every 10 minutes, we're going to do that. And now this is something that your sort of to-do app or your basic CRUD apps aren't going to need to deal with. But when you get into the real world and you start dealing with more real world use cases, you're going to start needing to do things on certain intervals. You're going to need to start checking analytics. You're going to need to start sending out emails. You're going to need to start looking for whatever, whatever your use case needs. And these cron jobs are a really powerful way to do that. So, and with these cron jobs, you can set them up in a variety of ways. The way we have it set up is we have a separate instance that's just custom built. That's This is just a Go server that's running up in the cloud. It doesn't serve requests or expose anything, but this is basically just a Linux server in the cloud, which is going to run this every two minutes for us. But you can also do this in a variety of different ways. There are different services like this guy right here, Airplane. This is what I used to do for our cron jobs, and they can set up an infrastructure for you where they will do something for you every 10 minutes. So the way I had it set up was every 10 minutes, they would make a request to fetch new forms. And then when you make a request to fetch new forms, it would go through, do all the fetching, then send back a response like done, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another way you can do it. There's a ton of different ways, but conceptually just know that these exist. And if you need, if you've run into some weird edge case where you're like, I don't really know how I would do this with just the normal like um, request response model, 
maybe you should use a cron job.